Hello and welcome, my name is Chris Shelton and I'm so excited because today I'm going to be talking about migraines and tension headaches, what are the root causes, and how do you fix it yourself. So stay tuned. My name is Chris Shelton and as more people sign on here, I'm just going to give a little background about myself. So I practice a, a very classical style of Chinese medicine. I've been in clinical practice now for, gosh, 22 years here in San Jose over off of Lincoln Avenue. And because of the success here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we've expanded also into Los Angeles. So I'm really excited about this class because one of the things that patients come in and see me for is migraines and there's many different root causes for that and so I thought before we get started here that we'd go ahead and, and uh, take a moment we're going to walk you through a breathing exercise really quickly but you know migraines affect millions of people around the world and, and understanding what the etiology or the root of the dysfunction is helps you understand then how to fix it. And what's really cool is, is that I'm coming out with my second book this year on how to fix back problems yourself. And the whole idea is about self-empowerment, you know, giving everybody the tools necessary to be the best version of themselves. So welcome, thank you for joining once again and, and for putting in the chat there where you're joining us from. But as we get started here, I'd like for us to take a moment and I want you to scan your body. Like, where are you at right now? If you were to close your eyes gently and say, okay, body talk to me, how am I feeling? You know, is my, how's my digestion? You know, how do my hips hurt? You know, um, do I have a headache right now or migraine? You know, maybe I have a little bit of anxiety. Maybe there's some stress or maybe you just feel great. So just take a moment here and gently close your eyes and scan your body. And on a scale of one to 10, I want you to memorize where you are at right now. And my goal is, is that by the end of today's class is that you feel better than what you did as we started here. So just take that mental note as to where you are. So this is what I hope to expect, like I just said, is for you to feel better than uh, what you did before logging on here today. I want you to have clarity of how stress can lead to headaches and migraines. And we're going to talk uh, in depth on that and what organ systems that it affects actually contributes to the migraines. And most importantly, how do we fix it ourselves? What do we do? What kind of tools can we implement in our lives that's effective, inexpensive, and we could take with us anywhere, no matter where we are, to be able to fix these headaches, okay? Uh, and I know patients, I have clients that suffer for these headaches for a long time and for years and have done all kinds of things from suppositories to, you know, narcotics, uh, you know, uh, some people, you know, smoke marijuana as a way to uh, help with the, the migraines. And for a lot of people though, it's a debilitating disease. It's lost time from work, uh, lost time from fun activities that you should be doing. And there's normally some precursor signs for people also if you're on the onset of starting to suffer from this chronic condition that we will talk about as we uh, go forward with our talk, our lecture today. So let's get started here. I just want us to set an intention. So gently close the eyes and I want you to focus on your breath. And the tip of the tongue, I want you to gently curl the tip of the tongue to the roof of the mouth behind the teeth as if saying the letter N. And I want the breath to come in and out through the nose. And as this happens, as you inhale, you feel yourself becoming more calm. And as you exhale, becoming more and more relaxed. As you inhale, you allow for your head to melt into your shoulders, relaxing the shoulders. Now allow for the shoulders to melt into the waist. Allow the waist to melt into the knees. The knees to now melt into the ankles. The ankles into the feet. And just imagine your feet melting into the floor. Imagine that you have roots now growing out from the bottom of the feet, extending twice the height of the body. And with this breathing, long, steady, even and deep, I want you to focus now on the breath pulling into your abdomen, in particular about one inch below the belly button. 
And as you inhale, you feel yourself becoming more calm, and as you exhale, becoming more and more relaxed. So with each inhalation, the abdomen expands. And then as you exhale, just allow yourself to let go, to let go of the thoughts of the day, to let go of what you have to do later on this afternoon. For the next 45 minutes together, being in this present moment, this is your time to take care of yourself, to give back to yourself, We call it self-love, spending that time, spending that time to be able to have the self-care, the self-love. And now as we inhale, I just want you to focus on those roots that are twice the height of the body. And as you inhale, I want you to imagine golden light from the earth coming up the roots into the legs and into the abdominal cavity as you inhale. And then as you exhale, descending out the legs, out the roots and down deep into the ground. Let's do a couple more breaths. Inhale. Feel the golden light come up the roots, up the legs, into the abdominal cavity. And then as you exhale, feel any toxicity, any tension in the body. Release out the legs, out the roots, and down deep into the ground. Last breath. Inhale. Tapping into the earth. And allow for this golden light to race up the roots up the legs, into the abdominal cavity as you inhale, and then as you exhale, allowing yourself to be centered, to be relaxed, and then from here, we're going to go ahead and finish up here by just pulling down the heavens, so what's going to happen is I'm going to reach up towards the sky, towards the ceiling, and connecting with your higher power, whatever that is, just imagine that goodness filling up every cell, every tissue of the body. Let's do two more, inhale, and exhaling, letting go, and centering ourselves, and exhale. All right, very good. So such a simple practice to do, and believe it or not, taking a pause and uh, allowing <clears throat> For yourself to breathe and remembering to breathe long, steady, even and deep is a simple practice that we could do in order to help to relieve stress. Okay, because when we're talking about migraines, okay, sure, when I see patients come into clinic, one of the things I talk about is diet. Um, are they drinking enough room temperature water, not ice water? Uh, and the reason why we say no ice water if you suffer from migraines is because scientifically our bodies operate at about 98.5 degrees. Mine operates a little bit lower than that. But if you take something from the refrigerator, like ice cold water, on average that water would be 54, 55 degrees. So what does that mean? That means that when that water goes into your stomach, now your stomach has to heat it up to 98.5 degrees to assimilate it and move it. Also, that cold will then penetrate from the stomach into the liver, which also will further create the dysfunction. So yeah, so we'll look at stuff like that. We'll look at, okay, well, how much greasy, fatty, fried food are we eating? How much sugar? How much alcohol are we intaking? Uh, wine, uh, the, the high sugary uh, alcohols, especially like wine. But most people don't realize that stress, chronic stress, a buildup over time, eventually has to show up somewhere inside the body. And here in the West, in looking at Western medicine, you know, we really look at how stress actually shows up as inflammation and then disease. Because did you know that headaches or migraines is actually considered a disease? Okay, so why is it considered a disease? It's considered a disease because it's out of balance, out of the norm, okay? So chronic stress, this is what happens, is that we have the stressor, whether it's at work, it's at home, it's with our spouse, our family members, whatever. We have that stressor that comes in, or it's a combination of above. We have that reaction to the stress. And that reaction to the stress, especially if we suppress it, so let's say we have something that really agitates us or irritates us, and we suppress it. Well, when we suppress it, guess what? That creates inflammation. This creates the obstruction which contributes to migraines and headaches. It creates wear and tear on the body and the organ systems of the body. 
So, you know, these emotions are good, and we're going to get into these emotions a little bit more as we move along here today, but eventually these organs say, okay, man, my cup is full. What else can I do in order to relieve this stress? Okay, so then what happens is that we have reduced ultimate health, and then we have increased sensitivities to stress, but guess what else happens also? We may also have increased sensitivities to smells. We may have increased sensitivities to light, to sounds, to certain foods. So, you know, when I was a kid growing up in the 70s, you know, we never heard of things like peanut intolerances or nut intolerances or uh, gluten intolerances, or at least I never heard of that as a kid. I grew up, well, we grew up kind of poor, so I always envied the kids that had the Wonder Bread and was hoping that I could one day have a piece of that Wonder Bread, but we never really talked about people or kids that I went to elementary school with having these issues. Well, it's because of this prolonged stress and then also how our food is processed nowadays that this increased sensitivity actually will then uh, allow for us to become more vulnerable to various types of things, like I said, light, food, smells, sounds, etc. And one of the root causes of it though is how much stress is inside your body. Now. For myself, when I first got started with this practice called Qigong, which is actually the foundation of acupuncture and the foundation of Tai Chi, when I first got introduced to it, I had all kinds of medical issues as a teenager. I had severe bloating and digestive issues, and uh, you know, I would eat something like a salad or an avocado, and I'd be in a fetal position an hour or two hours later in chronic pain or if I ate any kind of fat whatsoever, I would actually would wake up at one or two o'clock in the morning uh, vomiting. So I had some severe issues. And it wasn't until I was introduced to Qigong after, uh, after a severe back injury that after several months of doing these practices that suddenly it went away. And that's actually how I got started with the practice and going to school for, to study classical Chinese medicine. Okay, so when you look at stress, let's talk about our nervous system. Okay, our non, uh, autonomic nervous system is things that we, you know, uh, is the nervous system itself, right? And there's two components of this autonomic nervous system, and we have our sympathetic nervous system, and we have our parasympathetic nervous system. So, what is our parasympathetic nervous system? Well, those, that's the part of the nervous system that we just take for granted, like resting, digesting, breathing, sex drive, that's part of that parasympathetic nervous system. Like we don't even think about it, our body just does that. And thank God we have a parasympathetic nervous system because could you imagine trying to control all those functions inside of our body? It'd make me lose my hair. Anyways, so we have the parasympathetic nervous system and then we have what is known as our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight part of our nervous system. And my new book that's coming out on how to fix back problems yourself from the cervical spine down to the lower lumbar, one of the things I noticed several years ago because of all the diseases I see in clinical practice, the number one disease that I see nowadays is actually back problems. And one time I, some of our clients were flying us out to Skokie, Illinois, and I've seen these young basketball players that had a chance to play for the NBA, and doctors were saying, you know, you have lumbar stenosis, you'll never play ball again. And when I was flying back, I was trying to figure out, you know, back when I was a kid, you know, you know, only people you heard having back problems were people that were obese or had sedentary lifestyles. And nowadays, those back issues, just like migraines, does not discriminate against age, race, uh, gender, um, you know, whether you're a professional athlete or you are the couch potato, it does not discriminate. And I was trying to figure out, why is this? And then finally it clicked on, it dawned on me, this is why. Our sympathetic nervous system, so when God designed our bodies, that sympathetic nervous system was our fight or flight. And what does that mean? That means that that part of the sympathetic nervous system was meant for things like if your house was on fire to get um, out of the house. And so what happens is, is that um, any type of stressful situation, it kicks things into gear. If you're being chased by a bear, you know, uh, or if there is some type of famine. So what happens is, is that if you're being chased by a bear, the, the sympathetic nervous system actually overrides the parasympathetic nervous system and it says, okay, we're going to put a stop here for right now. We're going to take the blood from the stomach that we're digesting the food and we're going to send it to the heart, the lungs, to the brain and to our extremities so we can get out of there right away. 
That's why if you ever pay attention, uh, if you're eating and something stressful all of a sudden happens, what happens afterwards? You have a knot in your stomach. Why? Because of that sympathetic nervous system is taking the energy from your digestive system and now has spread it to areas of the body that are important because it thinks it's in fight mode. Well, guess what? I realized that the sympathetic nervous system actually does not know the difference between being chased by a bear, your house being on fire, or running late for an appointment, running late to work, having to pay bills, uh, or the demands of maybe having to go to school or, or to college or whatnot. So the sympathetic nervous system cannot distinguish between both worlds. And so nowadays, because there's so much, we're getting so much influx from you know, our, the media, social media, et cetera, plus our, our lifestyles, that the sympathetic nervous system is now on all the time. And so this is what creates inflammation and this is what starts to create the disease pattern and the breakdown of the stress inside the body. All right, and this is really, really fascinating to me. Most people don't know this, but the five major organs of the body, so the heart relates to fire, the fire element, and the style of Qigong that I teach is, uh, called, is related to the five elements. So the fire element relates to the heart and the pericardium, which is a sac that protects the heart. The negative emotions that actually attack the heart is the emotions of uh, overexcitation, um, um, too much joy, abandonment, loneliness. But you know, that heart will take the brunt of all the emotions. So what does that mean? That heart is the emperor or empress of the body, which means that it dictates how much of an emotion is going to be expressed or how much of an emotion is going to be suppressed, okay? So these emotions, don't get me wrong, are good. This is, these emotions are good. When they're expressed properly, this is our barometer as to what's going on inside of our, our environment, okay? So when we look at, you know, the heart as being the emperor or empress of the body, you know, this is where our consciousness is. This is where they have a saying that the, the brain is a reflection of the reality, but here in the heart, this is where our consciousness actually resides. Okay, so when we look at this earth element, well, what does earth element govern? Excuse me, the earth element governs the spleen and stomach and pancreas. All right, what emotions attack the stomach and spleen? The emotions of worry, anxiety, pensiveness, okay? overthinking things too much. So if you're somebody who gets stuck in their head a lot, this will affect your, your stomach and spleen. And we see all kinds of diseases uh, from digestive disorders to bruising easily. We see prolapses like prolapse of the uterus or prolapses of the bladder. This is where the organs actually fall out of place. This is as a result of the spleen being too weak. All right, so then when we look at uh, the metal element, the metal element relates to our lungs. So the emotions that attack the lungs is sadness, grief, disappointment, loss. We also say that the emotions of shame and guilt also will affect the lungs as well too. And so if you or somebody that you know, for example, has lost a loved one or a pet has ran away or you had to put a pet to sleep, you may have suffered or started to experience or somebody you know has experienced an unproductive dry cough. Well, that unproductive dry cough is not a sudden case of asthma. What it is is that the grief is actually stuck in the lungs, and this is what contributes to that unproductive dry cough. Okay, so then when we look at the water element, well, that relates to our kidneys. And what are the kidneys affected by? They are affected by fear, fright, and shock. Wow, fear, fright, and shock. So what are we talking about when we say shock? Well, shock is surviving any severe illness. So let's say, you were uh, suffering from cancer and you're going through chemo or, and or radiation, that actually will shock the system and attacks the kidneys. And we see numerous diseases that show up as a result of that, like tinnitus, which is ringing of the ears, meninears disease, which is chronic vertigo. We may have hearing loss. Uh, you know, there's whole types of, our hair may turn premature gray. So there's a whole number of things. But also shock could be surviving abuse, whether it's physical or emotional or both. Burning the candles at both ends, not getting enough sleep, will tax your kidneys. And your kidneys, most people don't realize this, but your kidneys are responsible for so many functions inside the body. They could, it influences the brain, it influences all the glands of the body, the bones, the bone marrow, uh, the bladder, the reproductive system. I mean, it's a foundation of blood and the fluids in our body. I mean, these kidneys, boy, they have a big job. 
And they say that at the time of conception between your parents and God and your environment, that this predetermines your kidney well. So what does that mean? It's like a battery. So as we age, this battery naturally, naturally declines. Okay, so this is why we start to see, after a certain age, we start to see a lack of uh, sex drive, for example, or uh, the bones become more fragile, or memory loss, or premature uh, premature grain, or uh, or hair loss. This is as a result of that. So shock, seeing or witnessing. I guarantee you that anybody that was who's been in war, anybody that was at Ground Zero at 9/11, at some level have some kind of kidney dysfunction, which what we would classify as a kidney dysfunction as a result of what they see, saw and what they experienced. Okay, so kidneys. Uh, the what element? This liver, we're going to talk about that a lot today because guess what? That liver is the root cause for migraines and headaches, tension headaches. Okay, what is the emotions? The emotions here is the emotions of anger and frustration and resentment, uh, rage, old anger. Okay, and now anger has gotten a bad rap. Anger is actually a good emotion. Now, anger is designed for us to fight for the underdog, to get out of uh, to get out of a bad situation, or to create positive change in the world. Right? When we need to change something, we have to rely upon that drive, that force of anger, in order to create this positive uh, positive change. But it's when the anger is not processed properly, or even worse, suppressed, that it actually will show up as disease, as we will see as we go along here. Okay, because what does it cause it to do? Well, when the heart gets out of balance from mania or excitation or whatnot, it causes the energy to become scattered and chaotic. You know, you think about somebody who's manic, they're up and down, up and down all over the place. Um, if worry, um, if you're worried all the time or or, or having anxiety, it causes the energy to stagnate. So once again, going back to that example of if you have a stressful situation and then all of a sudden, while you're eating, all of a sudden have that knot in your stomach. So it causes energy in the body to stagnate, okay? Uh, grief, what happens when you're grieving a loss? When you're grieving a loss of somebody, a loved one or whatnot, um, a breakup of a relationship, it causes the energy to become exhausted, all right? This is this area here we call the sea of chi. This is where our blood is formed. So if there's a grief weighing us down, then the lungs aren't able to pull in the air, which is necessary, uh, a necessary component for us to, to build blood. And blood is our chi. When we talk about energy and chi, what we're talking about is our blood. If your blood is weak, you have no energy, all right? So if, you're, if you lost a loved one or whatnot, or there has been a loss in your life and you you have this, uh, you know, so this underlying grief or whatnot, this is as a result, or this causes energy to become exhausted. And you may notice that you're tired. You may notice that you don't, you're listless. You may notice that you don't want to talk as much or your voice becomes very soft as a result, all right? Okay, so when we're looking at fear, what does the fear cause in the kidneys? Well, it causes the energy to descend and we will see this in that fight or flight uh, situation. Uh, sometimes when people are in that fight or flight, instead of fight, they go into flight and then they urinate themselves. So it causes the energy to sink or energy to drop. <clears throat> when we have anger, then um, we have this anger. It causes the energy to rise upward. Well, guess what? Our liver and our gallbladder both work together. And so what happens is, is that when we have this repressed anger and we have all these toxins in our liver, whether it's emotional toxins and or food toxins, you know, environmental toxins, whatever, this energy rises up and guess what? It gets stuck in the head. It gets stagnated here. This is where it gets stuck. Okay, so, so again, it's this anger. And I don't know if anybody's ever um, heard that saying that I was so mad that I saw red. That's actually a, a, a real thing because one of the things that the one of the 800 things that the liver influences the liver influences and controls your eyes so if you have flowery vision floaters in the eyes uh, detached retina uh, one of the root causes of that is a liver dysfunction so anyways because the liver controls the eyes and the other thing that the liver does too is it governs or i'm sorry it controls blood 
So when the person is so angry that what happens is, is that there's these collateral channels inside the body that connect to the eyes and guess what? They're so angry that all of a sudden, yep, they see red because what they're seeing is the blood actually flow up into the eyes and this is what's causing them to see red. Now, this is a warning sign. If somebody is seeing this kind of stuff, wow, there's a lot of detoxification that needs to go on here in the liver. In particular, uh, besides diet, an emotional detox as well. So this organ, again, this organ is a massive organ. It, uh, you know, it, uh, it you know, runs from the right side of the body and it encompasses, you know, across the midsection. It rests on top of the stomach. And again, one of the big things that the liver does is that it regulates our flow of chi throughout the body. So if it's regulating the flow of chi throughout the body, again, our blood is our chi. So if there's any kind of stagnation in the liver, whether it's from food toxins or emotional toxins or a combination of everything, then the stagnation actually will contribute to these headaches. Now, again, if you're not drinking enough room temperature water, not getting enough sleep, this also will be a contributing effect contributing factor as well too. But I would say 90% of the thousands of patients I've seen throughout the years, it comes back to this liver dysfunction. And what's really fun being in clinical practice is having this understanding and when a person has been suffering from migraines for a long period of time, being able to create change right away and then seeing the results. And then also giving the clients the tools in order to maintain it so that, that way they don't have to pay to see someone like me. So this liver affects the blood, it governs the blood, so if you're somebody that at 3 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon is running to Starbucks, part of that is a kidney dysfunction, but the other part of it too is the liver is not acting the way that it should. Another telltale sign that the liver may be out of balance is that besides the migraines, uh, for women we may have menstrual problems, which is considered a disease in Chinese medicine. So we're talking about clotting, clotting um, pain, uh, bloatedness, uh, mood swings, or, or maybe you're not having a period anymore. That's a knock on the, on the door too that this liver is out of balance because liver controls uterine blood as well too. So there's all kinds of talks that we talk about here about these organs and when they're out of balance from emotions. But again, because the liver governs the movement of blood, if that blood is being restricted, this affects the collateral channels, that affects the brain, or affects the affects all the way up into the head. And this is what really contributes to uh, what is going on when we're looking at, 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 at these types of dysfunctions. Now this may be brand new news to you, and that's our big thing is to educate people. And what I love to do is educate people of uh, how the body functions, because you know, I understand, according to science, how these organs function and what they are supposed to do. But one of the cool things about Chinese medicine that has, you know, thousands of years of study on the human organism is that these organs actually have a much, much, much greater functionality. All right, so what can we do? <clears throat> what can we do in order to be able to help ourselves with migraines? Well. One of the things you could do is you could take, we love doTERRA oils uh, because they're a high grade oil. And in fact, we just got back from Salt Lake City, Utah uh, at a big convention. And what you would do actually is, is that you take this peppermint oil that you see here on the screen. Now peppermint, every food or every herb has a certain energetic property and they benefit certain organs and certain foods will actually will actually harm certain organs of the body and further contribute as inflammation or disease but these oils for example the peppermint just smelling the peppermint for example just taking it smelling it i'm going to show you some uh, points on the base of the skull that we could rub this oil on okay and when we rub this oil on here the other thing that we could do too is that we could actually press like on the base of the skull here i'm going to show these points so this point here, the base of the skull, I don't know if you can see it here, but if you press up there, especially if you're somebody who suffers from migraines, this point will be tender to the touch. So what I want you to do, or what I recommend to my patients is they go ahead and press and push up, press and push up. Yes. Um, Tamara Smith said, I love my doTERRA infuser and essential oils. And Marissa said, I rely heavily on peppermint essential oil when I'm experiencing migraines. It really helps. Yeah, they really help. Uh, you know, this, the, this peppermint too, like if somebody has a plugged up nose, another remedy, I know we're talking about migraines, but I love 
sharing information. What you do is you take this, not the roll on like I have here, but you take this little jar of peppermint like I have here on the screen. You put a few drops into hot water in a bowl and you put a towel over your head and you actually breathe in uh, this peppermint, the mist uh, from, the, uh, from the hot water and this will help to open up your sinuses as well. So peppermint is cooling in nature. So when we look at migraines, believe it or not, migraines is what we consider it as a hot condition. So how do we treat it? Well, we treat it by doing things that cool the body down. Now, again, we don't want ice water because that ice water actually creates more heat. So if you're somebody that tends to run hot anyways, I would recommend taking one or two drops of this peppermint and put it in uh, room temperature water, or you can make some fresh peppermint tea, whether you buy the peppermint yourself and put it in tea. And believe it or not, even if you drink that hot peppermint tea, it would still cool your body down because energetically that herb is actually cooling for the system. And so anyway, so we could press, we could massage here. Here's our beginning of our um, bladder channel on the inner canthus of the eyes here. We could actually press. Here's another great practice that I give to clients too. So we take some of that oil. Be careful not to get it into your eyes though because it does burn. But we could go ahead and press all the way out to the outside edge of the eyebrows where the gallbladder channel um, actually begins. And we could massage here. This is a cool thing too. All right, we could massage the temples, yes. And then also too, like I'm gonna show on this next slide here, pressing in and up on the occipital part of the skull. This is gallbladder 20. You could always Google uh, gallbladder 20, where is it located on the internet, and it will show you boop, exactly where I'm talking about here. You could press in and up there. Being able to, again, on the occipital part of the skull, uh, where his hands are right here on her uh, inner part of her eyebrows here. This is a major point because here we have this bladder channel and this bladder channel runs over the top of the head. So guess what? The next points that I want you to look at here, bladder 10. Okay, so as you see here, um, on the gallbladder points here, on the outside part of the eye, this is a major, major point. Uh, I'm sorry, the triple burner channel is here, gallbladder here. So right here on the outside part of the eye, we're going to massage and we can massage again with that peppermint oil okay you can see here gallbladder 20 i have the uh, arrows pointing there where the gallbladder 20 is again it's at the occipital ridge that's the base of the skull there where you're going to press and you'll know it too because you'll press there and you're going to press in and you're going to press up and what i want you to do i want you to make this into a mindfulness practice too because our cells do listen to us what we say to them and what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that this energy the stagnation because that's what creates the pain is this there's stagnation up in here I want you to imagine as you press in and up on this gallbladder this energy actually releases down and releases down into the earth again you could also google where is bladder 10 uh, sometimes it'll be called urinary bladder or UB10 and and you type that in it'll show you exactly where that is and then what's going to happen is you're going to go ahead and press in and up there as well too so these are major points in order to release the excess energy out of the head which is rising up due to this liver and gallbladder being out of balance because again the liver and gallbladder work together and so if that liver gets out of balance guess what that gallbladder gets out of balance and even if you had your gallbladder removed which is another warning sign leading back to the dysfunction of the liver. Even if you had that gall, uh, gallbladder removed, you still have the acupuncture channels and points. There's still energy flowing through there. So even if your gallbladder is removed, because sometimes the question I get is, Chris, had my gallbladder removed, um, so would this still work? And yes, it still will work. This is the mind-body connection, you know, and uh, we have a saying that the heart houses the mind, which houses our shen or our spirit. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Eckhart Tolle or Deepak Chopra, but several years ago, my, my wife and I were in Los Angeles at the Shrine Auditorium where Deepak Chopra, and who's a physician, a doctor, and also Eckhart Tolle were given a speech, a speech on consciousness and the ego and this kind of stuff. It's a sold out audience. Deepak Chopra said, because between him and Eckhart Tolle was, they're, they're sitting in two chairs and there's a small table with a little vase with a rose sticking out of it. And, and uh, Deepak Chopra said, 
Everybody in the audience, I want you to stare at this rose that's in between me and Eckhart. He says, everybody see the rose? Everybody says yes. He says, now everybody close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Deepak says, okay, can you still see the rose? Everybody nodded or said yes. We can still see the rose with our eyes closed. Deepak says, now open up your eyes. He said that nowhere inside your brain is a rose. So what does this mean? This means that our mind is, or our brain is a reflection of our reality. The consciousness actually is here. And so learning how to get consciously connected to our bodies helps us with our ability to transform how we feel, transform our environment, and transform our, how we age, transform the disease process. And I just want to reiterate, headaches and migraines are considered a disease simply because it's out of balance. That painful obstruction syndrome, this debilitating, is the body's way of saying, help me. And chances are, it goes back to these emotions. All right, so nature and nurture. Uh, Deepak Chopra also, I love that man, uh, he wrote a book called this with a famous brain surgeons uh, quite a few years ago, about eight or nine years ago, called the Super Gene. I recommend you check it out. And what they were talking about is our DNA. And so why am I bringing this up right now, nature or nurture? Well, because if you live in a family who has a history of migraines or tension headaches, what Deepak Chopra talks about and this famous brain surgeon talks about in this book is that scientifically, if you look at the DNA strands, the helix, only parts of that DNA will show a potential possibility for this hereditary trait of migraines. Some people, it's heart disease, you know, some people, it could be other types of diseases as well too. So the, the cool thing that they talk about in that book, Deepak and this uh, brain surgeon that they talk about in this book is that what they've proven scientifically is that even if there's parts of the helix of this of your DNA that has a family history of, or generational history of, of migraines and tension headaches, if you change your environment, change your diet, and change how you emotionally respond to situations and stimuli in your environment, guess what? You will break the cycle and you will not get those migraines and those tension headaches. It also goes for heart disease and high blood pressure. If you change your environment for what you live and work under, change your diet according to a diet that benefits you, not one of these fad diets like we see a lot of times in LA, for example. Um, and then also change how we emotionally respond uh, to situations. Suppression of emotion creates stagnation and disease creates inflammation. And when we are able to transform that, then what happens is, is that the body gets to a natural state of equilibrium. So the cool thing, nature or nurture? Well, it's a combination of both, I believe, but changing your environment and changing how you are affected by emotional stimuli will change the process of disease. So like I talked about in the very beginning, my foundation of uh, traditional training is in a practice called Qigong. So what in the heck is Qigong? Well, Qi, again, is the life force energy that emanates through all things. In this case, for this talk today, in terms of Qi, I'm talking about it in terms of blood. Because again, if your blood is weak, you have weak energy or weak Qi. So we have a saying that the blood contains the Qi and the Qi moves the blood around the body. Gong is a skill for which we harness this life force energy within ourselves in order to help to create balance and change in our life. In particular, the style of Qigong that we teach is a style that deals with a mental emotional wellness and these practices are thousands of years old they're not uh, some kind of weird belief structure or anything like that they're very simple practices the they are again the foundation of acupuncture they are the foundation also of tai chi uh, and what i love about qigong i have a whole youtube channel where i teach these practices for free we have the chi club monday through thursday from 8 to 8 30 in the morning we have participants from around the world that join us. And the whole idea is, is that to teach people how to release their emotional trauma. When you learn how to properly and effectively release your emotional trauma, then what happens is, is that the inflammation goes down 
and the chronic cases that we see, for example, with migraines and tension headaches, also starts to dissipate. It's not magic, it's just understanding how the body works. Again, going back to your DNA, your DNA wants to be healthy. It's scientifically proven your DNA wants to be healthy. It just gets stuck. And a lot of times it gets stuck with the one thing that people don't realize is stress and emotions in particular, once again, the emotions of anger, hatred, frustration, and old anger and resentment. So when we practice these Qigong practices, this gives us this heart-mind balance that we're talking about. So, you know, there's gentle moving practices. Today what's going to happen is a, to give you another tool before we part ways here. Uh, for this talk anyways, hopefully we'll do more. Um, what uh, the, these Qigong practices do is it helps the heart harmonize with your mind. And so again, the heart is, takes the brunt of all the emotions. Think about it. If you get angry at something, what happens? Your heart races, then it attacks your liver and your gallbladder. Uh, if you become worried or anxious about something, your heart races, then it weakens your spleen and your pancreas. If you become fearful of something, what happens? You feel your heart race, and then it weakens your kidneys. Uh, if you become sad about something, your heart aches, and then it weakens your lungs. So what Qigong does is, is it gives you self-empowerment tools in order to deal with the uh, stresses that go, goes on in our day-to-day -day lives. Because we, most of us anyways can't just pick up and move to some exotic island somewhere and you know, kick back with our sandals off our feet and you know, um, not have any stress. I'm st still sure at some level there's still be certain types of stress that's different in that environment too. But, but what we can do is we can't maybe run from it, but what we could do is we could give you tools in order to empower yourself to be able to understand how to process and move through past and day-to-day -day trauma. All right, so this is a Qigong practice. It's very simple to do. We, all, all, we are all a vibration. Um, every, everything is a vibration. Um, even the chair that you're sitting on is a, is a form of consciousness. If it wasn't, it's, it's uh, atoms <clears throat> would disperse into nothingness if, if it didn't have a certain level of consciousness. So these sounds here actually are the sounds for the different organs of the body. The most common one that I give to people is the heart healing sound. Uh, because again, the heart takes the brunt of the body. And the heart sound, all we do with these sounds is, is that we focus on something. So let's say I'm focusing on the heart, for example. So let's just run through this really quickly here. Say I'm focusing on the heart, I'm going to inhale. Imagine a pink cloud filling up into the heart. So let's say there's something that just happened or there's something that's been going on in my life that's been troubling me. I'm gonna focus on that. Inhale, and if I'm alone, I'm gonna make the sound audibly. I'm going to imagine that circumstance leaving like a dark cloud, going to, so, <clears throat> excuse me, several feet away from the body and down deep into the ground. Over and over again, inhale. All right, but if I'm in public, obviously I'm probably not going to do this in public out loud, so I'm going to do it underneath my breath. And you do this over and over and over again. The key is, is to make this into a mindfulness practice by focusing on the trauma, feeling it, who's involved, what is involved. And in this case, we're talking about the heart. Imagine this pink cloud filling up into the heart because the color red or pink benefits the heart. And then as you make the ha sound, whether audibly or inaudibly, imagine that leaving like a dark cloud going several feet away from the body and deep into the ground. Okay, so the liver sound, Again, I want you to focus on the right side of the body. Imagine a green cloud filling up into the right side of the body. Focusing on something that creates resentment for you or anger. What, what's, maybe you saw something on the news that really makes you angry. Maybe there's a, something going on in your life, in your family or something that really, or in society that's really making you angry. Or maybe you have some old repressed anger that you think, oh, I dealt with that stuff years ago. Well, if you have migraines, chances are it hasn't been fully dealt with. So again, to make this into a mindfulness practice, now we can place our hands on our liver if we want to. And as we inhale, we can imagine a green cloud filling up into the liver on the right side of the body. And then as we exhale, making the shoo sound. So, shoo. 
So imagine that leaving like a dark cloud going several feet away from the body and deep into the ground. Do that over and over. Inhale. And again, if you're in public, you do the sound underneath your breath. So. So unlike conventional therapy, <clears throat> or this is my own uh, path with that in the past, is that sometimes I'd go in and they'd dig up stuff from the past and it's like they picked off the scab and when I left, I felt worse when I left uh, because the wound was still there. So with this, yes, I'm asking you to pick off the scab, but by doing the specific sounds, then what happens is, is that this is what helps to transform the vibration or the trauma, which then increases the functionality of the internal organ system and increases your vitality and can actually help to reduce the side effects or even change and transform headaches and migraines. All right. <clears throat> so as we wrap up here, how are we feeling now on a scale of one to 10? Is there a difference? Uh, my, my goal here is that you feel better than what you did, you know, 45 minutes ago. And so just to wrap up here, give you three tools. Here's the three tools. One is conscious breathing, just breathing into taking a pause and breathing into our abdomen, you know, like a newborn baby does, learning how to rebreathe, breathe like that innocence that we once all were, right? And pulling our breath, so a conscious breath. The second one, I gave the, the example of the mint, whether it's a, a, it's a essential oil that we could put on different points. Um, if it's an edible type of essential oil, uh, then we can put one or two drops into our water or we can make a tea also. So I talked about, you know, drinking things that are, that are cooling, energetically cooling, not ice water though. And uh, being able to massage these different points, all right? So this is, you know, these are a couple other tools. And then last but not, not least, I gave the simple practice of these healing sounds, which as silly as it may seem, they really do work. And if I had more time, I give case studies of how these work because we, we also are clinical directors for all of California for the Special Olympics for a program called Healthy Athletes, Strong Minds, where we give these tools also to the athletes, coaches, and their families to deal with stress. So we'd love to hear back from you. We'd love for you guys to let the Employee Wellness Department know how this class was for y'all and what you learned. We'd love to hear back from you what you learned and, and if there's any way that we could be a further assistance in your journey here, especially if you're suffering from migraines or tension headaches, then please reach out. We host a number of classes Monday through Friday online, uh, these Qigong practices. So uh, we have a number of instructors of really amazing and beautiful instructors that have the same mission as us, which is helping to uplift, uplift uh, society and, and self-empowering you to be the best version of yourself. So there's also Tai Chi classes, there's a number of different classes. Uh, we have a few more of these wellness talks actually scheduled throughout the year, which I'm really excited for. And yeah, so please stay in touch, please. In that 45, 50 minutes there, I gave a lot of information and tools to help us with migraines and tension headaches. So if you like this video, give us the thumbs up. Please share this video and leave a comment. Please reach out if you have any questions whatsoever. We're here to help you be the best version of yourself that you could possibly be. So please share this. And until next time, I'm Chris Shelton. I will see you later.